welcome. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the keynote. Uh, there, Emil talked about some of the new improvements that are coming into Neo4j causal clustering with 3.3. In particular, he talked about encryption and how we've implemented that over the data streams that we use. Uh, for this talk, instead, we would like to go a bit more basic and discuss what are the necessary steps you need to take, what are the basic considerations you need to have when you set up your own Neo4j causal cluster to put it into production. Um, to do that, uh, me and Stefan, we're going to do a little, like, uh, at first a presentation of the basic things that you need to keep in mind, configuration options, that sort of thing. And then Stefan is going to take you uh, through his Raspberry Pi cluster, where he has installed Neo4j 3.3. Uh, and he's going to do some demonstrations about how failover works, and that sort of thing, how you can connect with it, with driver supply load, that, you know, such, uh, those things. Uh, by the way, I'm Chris Gioran. Uh, I work with causal clustering, AJ kernel, and drivers teams uh, in the Neo4j product team. Uh, Stefan is a field engineer with us. Uh, he has many years and many deployments of Neo4j in production under his belt. Uh, to start off, let's discuss some of the uh, basic operational considerations that you need to have when you deploy Neo4j clusters, like the basic things that you need to concern yourself with. Uh, first of all, you need to be able to set up a Neo4j cluster, right? How do you form a cluster? What are the basic installation steps you need to take? And what are the basic configuration options to keep in mind to get it up and running? Then, uh, as your project uh, grows bigger or smaller, are your, as your scalability concerns increase or decrease or your cost considerations come into play, you need to size your cluster properly. Add more or remove machines. And finally, you need to concern yourself about failover. When disaster strikes, when something goes wrong and some machines go away, what are the knobs that you have to turn in order to influence the behavior of the cluster under such conditions? We're going to cover all these things in turn. Very basic stuff, but, it's, but extremely important. That's like basic everyday operations that you need to keep in mind. So, let's start with the assumption that you have two machines. They have IP addresses and you have downloaded and installed a Tarbo for Neo4j. Uh, that's the basic assumption. Uh, we're not going to touch the ideas uh, around how you configure a Neo4j standalone instance. Uh, that's not the topic of this talk. We'll assume that you have already configured your garbage collection, your memory, your uh, page cache and all that stuff. It's in place. We're going to focus on causal clustering alone. In particular, a free core cluster. That's what we're going to do. It's basic stuff. Uh, so, First of all, you need to have a way to make uh, these instances be able to talk to the world. You need to open up some ports, you need to configure settings so that they can transfer information between each other. Uh, there are three ports that you need to consider yourself with. The raft listen address, which is necessary for transferring raft information across the cluster. Now, Raft is the atomic broadcast protocol that we use, and it makes sure that every operation that you do against the cluster, every transaction that you do, happens in consensus. Uh, that means that whenever you commit a transaction, at least half of the cluster plus one members will have a copy of the transaction before you, you receive a successful commit notification. Uh, however, not all operations on the cluster need to go over this somewhat costly consensus algorithm. For example, when you do want to do backups or when, to do, when, when you want to introduce a read replica, uh, you don't have to go over that route. Instead, you need to open a separate port, by default 6000, which is called the transaction list address, which is the one that serves transaction data only and store copies. That is going to become important uh, when an instance falls back very, very much and it needs to fetch a new store copy or when to do a backup, stuff like that. And finally, you need to have the discovery listen address set. Uh, that is used for communicating between instances membership information and for new members when they join the cluster to have a way to discover what is already in place. Uh, let's not forget, of course, to set the database in core mode. Uh, that setting can be changed to read replica if you so desire to introduce a new read replica into the cluster. Now, we're going to do read replicas uh, on the second part. I'm not going to touch them here because that like, would be way too complicated, actually. Uh, now, we have the databases, they can talk to the world. They must also be able to talk with each other. That's where the setting initial discovery members comes in. The initial discovery member setting is mandatory. It's not, uh, it doesn't have a default value. The previous one I mentioned do. 
However, this one you must set by hand. And it is a concatenation of the various discovery list addresses that you have set across the cluster, comma separated. They have, it has to be the same on all members. So you just copy paste it across so that everyone can see everyone. Now, if you do all the steps and you start up your instances, you got yourself a new 4 j causal cluster. It's going to have a leader elected, that's going to be the read and write endpoint, and two followers that are read capable, but they also act as hot standbys. In case the leader goes away for some reason, they're going to step in and take over the leader role, so you don't lose your right endpoint. All of that is transparent, provided you use the route, the bulk plus routing URI scheme in your driver. When you connect with that, the driver is going to do all the dirty work of figuring out who is the current leader, direct your right who is there, or do a, lo a least connected load balancing strategy to spread around your read load across all of the cluster, including read replicas, if you have them. So that's it. You have yourself a Neo4j cluster. Uh, and as time goes by, you may want to consider changing the size of it. So how do you go about that? Well, the simplest scenario is you want to add a new member. That's as straightforward as introducing the members in the first place, as, when, as the steps that you took to create the cluster. For that, you need to set a bunch of options like this, which are similar to the ones that we did for setting up our initial cluster. The main difference here is the initial discovery member setting. There, we have added not only the three initial cluster members, the existing members, but also the IP address and discovery listen address of the new member that we want to introduce. Now, that is necessary and it's also highly recommended that you update the initial discovery member setting on all three existing members. That is not strictly necessary because just having a single access point into the cluster will allow the member to join. But in case for some reason you want to bring the whole cluster down for maintenance or whatever, when you start it back up, it is good to have consistent configurations across the cluster so that it forms again the way that you expect it to. Removing an instance is even simpler. You just stop it, you remove it, and the size of the cluster will go down. Uh, now, there is a slight nuisance here that we need to be aware of. The size of the cluster implies a replication count for all the transactions that you have. So when you start with a cluster size of 3, say, your replication factor would be 2. That's a majority. That's half plus 1. Whenever you commit a transaction, by the time you get a commit back, you are guaranteed to have two copies of the transaction that you just committed. So you can afford to lose at least one member. Uh, when you remove members, this starts going down. So you must have a way to influence the behavior, in particular what you want the minimum replication factor to be. For that, we have the setting that's called expected core cluster size, and that defaults to three. So we assume like, that your basic cluster is going to be three members, and that's it. The way that it influences the replication behavior and how members can leave the cluster is better uh, demonstrated through an example. So let's go through a five instance cluster and compare what happens when the setting is set to three compared to what it's set to five. And we're going to start removing members. Now, for a cluster of five, you would expect the replication count, the number of copies that you get for every transaction, to be at least three. That's half of five plus one. As you remove members, you can go down to two and still your application count can be three. You still have three surviving members. So whenever you direct the right query to this, to this cluster, you still get your three copies and everything is fine. So you can remove two members easily. However, when you remove a third member, that's when it gets, starts to get interesting. Because if you wanted your cluster size to be five, that is your application factor of three, then you cannot remove that instance. If you remove it, that's a hard failure. The cluster cannot continue because it cannot provide the guarantee that you asked of it. So it's going to go into read-only mode and start printing warnings everywhere that you have gone below your expected cluster size. However, if you had set it up to be three, then you're still good. Replication factor for three is implied to be two, 
so we still get your two copies. You will need to remove an additional instance to get a hard failure from the cluster and all the associated warnings if you had it set to three. Uh, so yeah, that's basically it. That's how you add and remove members. Uh, since we're talking about failures, let's look at how failover is handled in the cluster and what, and what you can do to influence it. So the main thing that you need to concern yourself with is what happens to the leader, because that's, the, that's your only right endpoint. Uh, the way that it is implemented, and honestly there's no other way to do it, uh, is to have timeouts. The leader periodically sends heartbeats to all the followers, and as long as the followers receive it, they assume that the leader is good and nothing happens. The leader stays there. Your Bolt plus URI driver is going to connect to it and direct all the rights there. So all's good. Uh, but what happens when it stops responding? For whatever reason, the leader may be under high load and it may not be able to send those heartbeats regularly. Uh, maybe it's going under a high GC pause or maybe even the wire came off. So how do you deal with that? Well, the main uh, configuration setting for that is the leader election timeout, and we default it to seven seconds. Uh, that is the, you should consider this to be the maximum acceptable non-response time for the leader. That's what it effectively is. If the leader doesn't work properly for at least, for at most this time, then some other instance is going to step in and take its place. We have defaulted it to seven seconds because that is the value that we saw worked when we deployed cluster on AWS across the globe and applied moderate load. Uh, this kind of network setup is quite uh, usual, but it is also highly volatile when it comes to round trip times uh, for packets to go around the globe. So seven seconds gave us a quite stable cluster, like less than a leader switch per hour. Uh, again, leader switches are not something to be scared of necessarily, uh, they happen, but as long as you use your Bolt plus uh, routing URI driver on the driver, then everything is going to work out. It's going to be transparently taken care of automatically anyway. Uh, if you want higher failover rates because you have very sensitive, time sensitive write load and you have all of your instances set up in the same rack and a very good network backing it up, then you probably want to move that down. If you have sporadic load that has very large transactions and occasionally the leader takes a bit more to respond and that doesn't necessarily imply failure, then you probably want to raise that up. That's mostly through experimentation and understanding your own setup and deployment environment. Uh, yeah, so pretty much that's it. That's all the configuration settings that you need to set, set up and get running a Neo4j cluster. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Stefan now, who's going to take all the information that I presented here and he's going to put them in practice on his Raspberry Cluster. Thanks, Chris. So now I'm praying to the demo god. I'm doing a live demo here uh, with Raspberry Pis, with a camera, with a lot of setup, so anything can go wrong. So praying that it doesn't happen. Um, before uh, looking at the Raspberry Pis, I want to show you. Um, how, from a point, from a few point of an application developer, how a single instance of Neo4j, of course, causes an outage in your application if the database goes down, which is a very trivial thing. Um, to show that, I don't use the Raspberries. I use a Docker image. So let's. I just need to. S I need just to stop something from the preparation. I forgot about that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I want to start a Neo4j Docker image. Um, that would be the, 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 the call. It's the last line that it's important. Uh, as you know, Neo4j is available um, as a Tarchi Z image, uh, as Debian packages, Red Hat packages, and also we do support Docker images. So Docker images are fully supported, and I'm going to use them here. So let's just run this. Okay, it will spit out some, some messages about starting up. Um, then I have a small demo script. I need to open that. Uh, demo client GRUI. So uh, that is written in the GRUI language. 
it's like Java on steroids. Uh, one, one of the cool things about Groovy is that you have your, your dependencies of your code directly in the code here. So that is a grab annotation, so it takes the newest version of the Java client driver. Um, then there's boring stuff about dealing with um, command line arguments. And here is uh, the, this typical, typical pattern of how you work with the Bolt driver. So the entry point is a graph database class, which you supply, uh, which you call driver, and you supply a URL. The URL is either something like Bolt plus routing slash host name, or if you work single instance, it's only Bolt slash slash host name. Once you have a driver instance ready, you can ask the driver for opening a session. A session is a rather cheap object, and be aware that the session is not thread safe. So if you have a multi-threaded um, piece of software, be sure to not uh, share sessions over threads. And within the session, then I can run a cipher command, and then I digest the result. So I expect here a single result, and I get the first first column of that one. The query that I'm using would be something like, I just want to simply count the number of, of nodes in my database. Um, yeah, that's my client program. Let's just run that now. Um, that's demo client Groovy. And then I pass in the um, Look close. So since I exposed the, the bolt port, which is seven by default, seven six eight seven, uh, via Docker as a um, minus p option as a port mapping, I can I can just call from the from the host. And what we'll see is that um, that script will fire each second, um, ask for how many nodes you have. Of well, it's a boring empty graph, so not fun, something fancy. Uh, when stocking, uh, stop, oh sorry, I shouldn't stop that one. I should have stopped this one. Yeah, when stopping now Docker, obviously we get some error messages here. And so now let's assume our database gets started up again. You'll see that the client uh, recovers. Given some seconds to wait. Come on. Yeah, it should work. Now we need a kind of pause music. Okay. Hmm. Exactly that worked while preparing. Yeah. First failure. But if we if we just restart the client, obviously it will run again. But this was the first failure. Now we switch over to the, to the next step in the demo. I want to uh, show you the Raspberry Pi setup and um, explain how this um, leadership role takeover works. That's maximum failure now, the, the battery is empty. Oh shit. Um, yeah, what can we do? Um, let, okay. Sorry, I don't have a replacement battery, so my beautiful setup doesn't work. Um, do you have an idea what we can do? Well, the light turn. Uh, it's a, it's a For the Canon uh, camera battery, so this doesn't work. So, um, yeah, I, I, then I probably just hold it up and, and show, it, show it to you like that. So, um, what, we, what we have here is, let's stop that. So, uh, I got here a stack of four Raspberry Pi computers. It's um, Raspberry Pi version 2, which means they have one gigabyte of memory. On each of them, I have the 
uh, 3.3 release candidate one installed and attached to the ris Raspberry Pis there is a LED board. So each of the raspberries has three LEDs. Um, you probably see a green one here. So the green one indicates I'm the leader of the cluster, so I do accept reads and writes. The yellow light indicates that Raspberry Pi is a, is a follower, so it can handle uh, reads and is part of the cluster and also part of the consensus commit. And the red light indicates it's a read replica. Um, Chris, you mentioned briefly read replicas. Read replicas are basically not part of the Raft cluster, so they don't participate in the consensus commit. They can never become leader, but they do serve reads. So they are the way to scale out your Neo4j cluster for massive read operations. Um, what I'm doing now is I, uh, so the leader is currently the one at the very bottom. So I SSH into that instance. And then I'll, I have a script to simulate a network outage. I just set up a few IP filter rules to block network traffic on the, all the ports that Chris mentioned for these free channels and some more. So my, my blocking script would look like, like this. So I'm adding uh, for input and output chain in IP filter, you see all the ports being listed here. Probably should make that a little larger. Can you read it in the background? Okay, cool. So let's just, uh, and this um, cluster election timeout, uh, which defaults to seven seconds, has here been set to two seconds. So when I run that script, um, you will probably notify that the green light goes off and another one takes over the green roll within with two seconds plus a little bit additional time because the, the script that it, uh, puts the status onto the LEDs has also a little bit of delay. So let's run that. IP tables block. Okay, so again, two seconds. And let's see if we get a new leader. One, two, and you see the green one gets off. The green one was taken over by the next one. And we're good. So the cluster is again available. So we can then unblock it and um, reconnect the machine to the cluster. And there you see another one gets the green light. So you always have one leader at, regardless what you do, there will be always one leader. That's the guarantee of, of uh, causal clustering. Okay, with that in place, um, I will want to show how you can work with writes. So I get another script. Uh, no, it's, it's apparently the same script with a different configuration. Um, it's the demo client. So um, we have our cluster running. So I get off here. Now we run the demo client again. This time we use bolt plus routing protocol. And the URL is, the host name is, it's one of the um, cluster machines. I use 100 here. And I need to supply that I want to fire write requests. So whenever you open a session in, in the bolt driver, you can specify if that should be a write or a read. So I'm going to uh, send a write here. And my cipher statement will be, so let's just create a node. And then um, let's match all the nodes and return the count of all the nodes back. Yeah, let's run that. What you see now is uh, you get some logging output from the driver. It first gets in contact with the cluster, asks for the routing table, and you see here in the last line the routing table, it says it returns the, num the list of machines that can uh, serve writes, which is our leader. So here, that's the leader. And you get a list of all the readers. That is then the, the followers plus the read replica. 
And then you get a message here, um, driver initialization done. Then it takes some time. The CPUs are, are rather busy and, um, well, it's a rather sm uh, slow machine. You should now see, um, yeah, here. So we add now a node every, every second, roughly. And you see here, uh, if you have access to the, um, to the L if you can see the LEDs, you see um, when a request is processed, you see lights flashing. Okay, um, that's good. Now let's, let's again block the leader. So we learned the leader is machine 101. Let's just verify that by the wiring. That is the second one, yes. So I SSH into the leader and do tables block. What I expect is that um, the role gets taken over by another machine, which we see here now. And after, because the, the new leader hasn't yet the cipher statement in the query cache, so it takes some time to uh, bring this in the, uh, in the query plan cache, and then it should just continue to work. Yeah, we need to probably wait some time for that. Yeah, now, now we got it. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So, um, of course, we can show the same thing for, for the reads. I'm going to stop the client again, uh, reset the IP tables. Okay, so cluster is complete again. And now we can do the very same by running a read statement. So I'm using now simply, I'm just counting notes now. And I also don't send it as a write, I send it now as a read. And what I expect is that we see flashing, um, so the queries get processed by all the readers and the read replicas in a kind of round robbing fashion. Um, the default strategy in Neo4j 3.3 is a kind of least connected. So the routing protocol decides to send that request uh, to, um, to the least connected machine. In our case, um, we don't have much connection, so it's de facto round robbing that we will see. Again, we get the um, we get the IP uh, the, the routing tables, and initialization is done. Now we also need. Now you see it's counting 56 nodes and give it a little bit of time to that every machine has processed the query at least once and it's getting significantly faster. Okay, next one, come on. So routing table was updated. I also, there's also a setting where it can uh, uh, give a ti time to live for the routing table. And here you see now, if you look at the LED board, that um, it's processed by different machines every time. Okay. That was enough for, for the Raspberry Pi part. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you is this uh, a co a concept of causal consistency. So the, 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 it's even in the title of the clustering uh, architecture called causal consistency, which means there is a causal dependency between transactions. So uh, assume if you don't have this de causal co um, dependency, you can send a write to the cluster. And since the update, the cluster updates might be asynchronous, 
So there might be a short time delay until that, um, that transaction appears on other machines. So if you send a, write requ a read request to another instance in the cluster, it might happen that the, trans the stuff that you just wrote a millisecond ago is not yet there. So with that, you need to declare a, a, um, a, a dependency between the two trans transactions. So to show you that, I'll start up um, a Docker cluster in the same way we started for the first part, the, um, the single instance Docker. So I inst start here now four Docker instances. It's pretty much the same setup as on the, on the Raspberries. So I get three, three core instances here and I get one read replica. This is pretty much a copy paste from the, from the manual, uh, from the operations manual. Um, except that I switch off authentication here for my, for my test purposes. Okay, let's run that. Okay, it takes some time to form the cluster. Let's give it a little bit of time to work on that. What you see here as an output is just the, uh, the ideas of the Docker images that have been started. You can verify that by doing Docker PS. So you see here the four machines that have been started. Um, yeah, now let's just validate that um, we do have a connection already. Let's one, one, seven, two, eight, zero, two, seven, four, seven, four. Ah, I had a typo here. It's 18 and not eight. Let's ping it. Yeah, we can ping it already. Yeah, now the browser is online. Okay, so looks good. So the cluster is formed. You can, if you if you have access to the browser, you can, for example, type sysinfo, and then you see here the, the, the cluster status, which is the, are the leaders, which are the followers, and so on. Let's just close this. And I want to show you this short script that I use for this um, causal um, dependency check. So I do two trans two, so I first open a, a regular driver session, a uh, driver uh, connection. Then within that driver instance, I create a session in write mode, which means that will always be pro uh, processed by the leader. And on that one, I create a node and uh, return the internal ID of that node back to the caller. And it's stored here with node ID. And what I do then is I ask the session for the last bookmark. So every transaction gets, that gets processed returns a bookmark, which is a unique identifier for that transaction. And the second part of that script then performs a read. It just tries to look up that node by ID and returns it. And if we, if we find that node, we will see a message saying, all oh, fine, we retrieved that node. If we can't find that node by that ID, it means we're, uh, we're on an instance that doesn't have yet applied the right. So we get a, um, an error message here. So, oh my God, whatever. Um, yeah, and please note that I'm not using the bookmark here. That one is commented out. So I will first run that script um, without causal dependencies. So that is then point demo, demo client. Yeah. So pretty much the same thing. So it will connect to our Docker, to my Docker cluster yet, ask for, um, ask for routing table. And you see here already the, the failure messages saying, oh my God, so we definitely have this problem of that we can't see our own rights. Now let's fix that problem. I'm going to stop the, the script. And I start off with adding, so I change my code, that I supply, when I open the session for reading, I now do supply 
the, the bookmark that I acquired from the, from the right. And with that, you shouldn't see this. Um, we should always find the note that we just written. That's real. I'm not sure if I saved it. So you see here, let's just leave it running and then but we will, we will not see this error message again. Okay, so that proves this concept of, of causal consistency in a very easy way, which you can easily play on your local hardware or on Raspberry Pis. Um, this is almost what I, what I prepared. I really apologize for the, for the battery problem. Um, I think I will do a kind of um, webinar on that where we do the recording then uh, with, the, uh, with the proper lights. Uh, so we have four minutes left for questions. Yeah, please. You see? So, right is happening only on one machine. Is that by design or is that something that... Can yeah, the question is the rights appear only on one machine or if that is, is by design? I think that is a question for you. The rights appear on a single machine. Correct. So let's give a bit of more background on why bookmarking is necessary and where that causal uh, idea comes from. So like I uh, briefly touched upon on the subject of replication uh, account, replication factor, however you want to call it, uh, whenever you try to commit a transaction on the leader, that leader will spread it out to all the followers that exist in the cluster. But to return from the commit, it doesn't necessarily wait for every single one of them to respond. All of them eventually will, until, unless there is some kind of failure somewhere. But by the time it manages to gather a majority of acceptance votes from all the followers, it will return your transaction as committed because the purpose of having the, the desired replication factor has been achieved. However, that leaves a minority of the members that have not necessarily yet received the transaction. If in the meantime you go and ask one of those members to read your own right that you just did, that may not be there. That's where the idea of bookmarks comes in. And it's even more important when you deploy with read replicas, which fall with even a less, uh, in less frequency than the rest of the followers. So by supplying the bookmark, you guarantee that the right that you just asked to happen and indeed was successful will be present before your read transaction executes in any of the members. If you're lucky and you go to a member that already has a transaction, that's a no work. It, you return it automatically. But you may have to wait a bit, depending on your routing strategy and what you have. more than one machine to write to. The way it's configured here, there's just one machine that's configured as a way. Correct. There's only one leader. There is always, so technically speaking, there can be more than one leaders at any given point because partitions may happen, but the guarantee that is offered is that only one of those leaders will be able to do right transactions. So if the unfortunate thing happens and you enter a partition state, then you may have access to a leader, but that, acts, that leader will not accept rights and you will get back errors in your transactions. There will be always at most one leader that can accept rights. That's always true. Okay, so the question is, what is the limit for the number of read replicas that you can have? None that we have found. We can have hundreds of read replicas. And it gets even more interesting when you spread it out over groups. That's, of course, an advanced topic somewhat for the deployment of UFOJ clusters, but you can tier your replicas and have them spread out geographically so that you have focal points which serve transactions and only that. And Although that comes at the cost of a slightly higher delay for transactions to propagate, it can scale practically indefinitely. No, a read replica always keeps a full copy of the graph. Let's do one more. Yes, please. Your read replicas will always be kept up to date, if that's what you're asking.
Uh, so if the question is if you need to do anything to get read replicas updated, then the question is no. There is nothing you need to do. Read replicas will pull uh, frequently and will get eventually up to date. And your bookmarks will work. Uh, so we're out of time. Thank you yeah, very much for coming. Yeah, one thing. Uh, I'll, I'll try to put the, the Raspberry Pi cluster to the dev zone so then you can look at the LEDs yourself because you couldn't see it from the background. Sorry for that, but failure happens. <laughs>